Welcome to the Newport News Police Department's Facebook Live. I am Stacy Estep. I'm with the Newport News Police Communications Division. I oversee the training portion of our 911 center. And I'm here to talk about a few things with you guys and answer questions that you all may have. Um, first thing is, is I know that you guys have seen us pushing to get fully staffed. As of the beginning of 2021, we were there. However, we are still currently taking applications. Our process has opened up again, and we're looking for applicants for an April Academy. It'll be starting the end of April. So those of you that are joining me are probably wondering what exactly it takes to start the process. Um, first and foremost, you have to go to the police department's website and pull up the application. Once you go and you find the application and you apply for it, we will be contacting you generally within a week to two weeks, um, depending on how many applicants we have coming in. It could take three to four. We do see a surge where sometimes we get several hundred applicants at one time. So once you've put in your application, I or our manager administrator will contact you just verifying that you're definitely still interested. Once you tell me you are definitely interested, I send you an email immediately with a packet of information going over the process itself, what to expect with the job, our hours, because for some reason, a lot of people don't believe me, but we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, a lot of people, for some reason, think that we have holidays off, um, inclement weather, we don't come in, and that's not the case. Um, I have driven, I can tell you, during a hurricane, I drove across the Monitor Merrimack with water splashing up over the sides of the bridge. So just to ensure that I was at work and prepared and ready for duty so that I could answer calls and dispatch apparatus and officers to the scene. Um, outside of that packet, you also get a link inside of it that goes over our critical test and it allows you to go and take a practice test so you can kind of see what it's like. We re require that critical test to kind of check to see your um, keystrokes per hour. Now that's not words per minute, it's literally counting your keystrokes per hour as to um, how, many you're t how many you're hitting. So we require 2,820 keystrokes per hour. That includes your spaces, your backspaces, every letter, um, then we also are checking for your prioritization. We're checking to see if you're able to summarize based off of what citizens are giving you because we do do, um, we have to summarize what callers are providing us. We can't give, put everything that they give us in the call. Excuse me. We are also um, checking to see um, your critical thinking because we're checking to verify you could tell the difference between a police call and a fire call. All of this is extremely important when it comes to our call processing and the way we dispatch apparatus. Outside of Critical, once you pass Critical, you're then contacted by me and I tell you, yay, congratulations. We're super excited that you want to join our team. And we bring you, um, we send you an email with a release of information requesting that you fill it out and a request for your ID. We forward all your information to our recruiting division and they assign you a background investigator and I give you a background packet to fill out and you'll have generally two weeks to complete that background packet. Once you complete the background packet, that background packet is then turned into your background investigator and they start the back end um, of the hiring process and they ensure that there's nothing that we need to be concerned about, that you're an upstanding citizen and that you'll fit in well with our team. After that, you're assigned um, a polygraph when you come in and you get a polygraph done. We treat our dispatchers just like officers. The only difference is, is we don't have to do the agility test, which is pretty nice because um, Lord knows I don't run. So if you see me running, you know, you know to hit the road. Um, <laughs> so um, outside of the polygraph, once you pass the polygraph, you're set up for an interview. And the interview is with our 911 administrator, Ms. Mangum, and our assistant chief. And they then determine if you will be a good fit for our team down in the center. After that, they will sometimes offer a conditional offer, or they'll advise you that they have a couple different people that they're looking into, and they'll give you a call back. And we move forward with the process and kind of get the ball rolling. 
Um, and then after that, you're assigned to our academy and our academy then starts out with that six to eight week period, depending on what we have going on. Um, and then the six to eight weeks, you get various certifications that are required on our end, as well as the Department of Criminal Justice that we utilize and that oversees us. Our 911 Centers Academy is completely accredited, which means we do all our in all our own training in house, which is just like our police department. We do not have to send you guys out anywhere. All of our instructors are certified through DCJS. We are able to host various trainings and provide numerous things to our staff because we have numerous instructors. Some of the things we added this year, um, we did disability awareness training, which is a full eight hour course for our dispatchers talking about what to expect with stroke victims or people that have hearing or speech impairments. Um, how to deal with calls about people with autism, how to deal with um, people with traumatic brain injuries. And that's because more and more people um, that are have some type of disability are calling into 911 and it allows us to be ahead of the curve instead of falling behind and something happening. Um, we also do implicit bias training, which is a day of training, implicit bias, fair fair and impartial call taking, cultural awareness and ethics all in one lump sum for an eight hour course. We do CPR, we do emergency medical dispatch in our city. We um, ask numerous questions, which I'm sure if any of you have ever had to call 911, you've probably wondered why we ask 7,000 questions when you just want that medic to arrive. Well, we determined back in 2007, 2008, that we were going to begin um, providing emergency medical dispatch to our citizens and that allows us to question callers while the medics are en route to assist the medics in determining what might possibly be going on before they get on scene to make sure that they have everything they need. It also ensures that I can send instead of just a medic, I can also send an engine if needed or maybe I need an engine and an EMS captain and it allows us to kind of determine our response based off of questions that um, our citizens answer for us. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, you get certified in public safety telecommunicator, which is a 40 hour class. The 40 hour class goes over the basics of call taking. We have one full day on legal and liability, which we talk about dispatchers that have been in the news recently, um, especially when it comes to our profession. Nobody really thinks about us until they think we've done something wrong. So it's really important that our dispatchers understand why we do what we do and why we don't do what some um, other dispatchers have done in the past that you see on the news. And they bring different court cases that they found because they're assigned to bring court cases to determine what exactly is going on. Um, and we discuss that for a day. We also do national incident um, management system training, which is through FEMA. We do FEMA 100, 200, 700, 800, and 902, which goes over incident command. Um, it goes over active shooter, active assailant. We have a full day of active assailant training that goes with that. Um, it's important that our people get as much training as possible to prepare them for the worst because your worst day is our every day. So we have to make sure that our people are as prepared as possible when they answer that phone. And then on top of that, a lot of people worry about the stress and the call types that we take. And so we ensure that our people go through um, SISM training, which is our critical incident stress management. And I know um, JP Smith came and talked to you guys about our SISM team. And so our people learn about SISM. They learn about stress first aid for the first responder. They learn about our EAP program. They learn about various avenues that they can take to keep their mental health sound. And that's an eight hour course in itself as well. Um, once you get out of academy, you're then assigned to the floor and everybody thinks that our training is probably not that strict. We don't, it doesn't take that long. It actually takes for a public safety specialist one, which means you're answering phones and dispatching fire. It can take 14 to 20 months to get fully certified from the time you start academy until the time you 
you were done. And if you want to be a public safety specialist too, which means you're doing phones, you're doing fire, and you're doing police, it takes anywhere between 18 to 24 months. So it could take up to two full years from the time you start academy until the time you're fully certified as a full dispatcher, as I call an adult dispatcher is what I tell um, my trainees. They start out as infants and we work them through the stages. Um, you are assigned out of academy, you are assigned on the floor to a communications training officer. When you're assigned to that communications training officer, our call taking portion takes approximately three months. Outside of that, you then um, move to either fire or police. Fire and police can take anywhere from three to four months, depending. Um, and then you switch whichever one you just did, you'll ne you're now certified on. So you would then do either police or fire, depending. And that's another three to four months. Um, and it also allows for little wiggle room if needed. Um, depending on the person, because we all know that not everybody learns the same way. We don't all learn the same speed. So it allows us to have a little wiggle room. So if some people finish early, that's great. If some people take another month or two, that's all right too. Um, our goal is to get you certified um, fully. I like to say everybody is going to do all three, but I know that not everybody loves the adrenaline of the police radio. Some people like the safety of the fire radio where they don't have to worry about foot pursuits or vehicle pursuits or any of that stuff. Um, I live for all of it. The busier, the better. The crazier, the better. Um, I'm definitely an adrenaline junkie. I live to get all the good calls or what I call a good call, you know, gets my blood pumping and feels like I'm on scene without having to be on scene. Um, it's been asked what exactly makes a good dispatcher. So when we talk about what makes a good dispatcher, you want to be calm. It helps to be organized. Um, if you have a type A personality, this is the job for you. Um, you have to be able to multitask. And a lot of people say you can't multitask, which maybe. However, you have to be able to prioritize the thoughts in your head. You have to be able to answer the unit that's talking to you on the radio while also putting information into a call for service while also talking to your pod partner about what's going on so that everybody knows um, what type of call you're processing. Or maybe your officer's in a foot pursuit, so you need somebody to call the joining jurisdiction. Um, you have to be able to do more than just that one small thing that you're working on and look at the broader picture. Um, it also helps if you are able to just let things go. This is not a job where you can harbor thoughts about a call for service you took or how you and an officer ended the night because both of you were being cranky. Um, none of that is able to be held over to the next day. You have to just let it go. Um, pretty much like the saying where it says water on a duck's back. We get calls for service that are horrible, horrible. We hear things on the phone, we hear things on the radio that nobody wants to hear. Um, definitely officers and firefighters have it, you know, rough because they see it. Downside to dispatch, we hear it and we have no idea unless we ask about it, what's going on. A lot of people always ask me what my worst call is. And to be honest, I can't ever remember because I try not to keep track of it. But I can tell you some of my best calls. Um, when I was here, I started in April of 2008. Two months into my career, I did a life-saving CPR to, well, I did. I provided instructions to a caller to do life-saving CPR on her mother, who was 92, that she found not breathing and um, not conscious. And because of it, she I was able to get her to calm down. And she did life-saving CPR on her mom, and her mom was transported. And I received an award for that because the fire department couldn't see how I got the daughter to calm down enough to do the CPR. Um, in my th almost 13 years, it'll be 13 years in April, I have delivered seven babies, which is amazing. Um, if you don't know, that's by far the best. My seven babies outweigh any bad call that I've taken ever in my life. Um, and I've done other CPRs, but they don't stick out with me as much as my first CPR does. Um, my first CPR definitely sticks out a whole lot more than any other call for service that I've taken. Um, I've taken calls where I've listened to people that w took their last breath. I've trained so many people and listened to them while well, they listen to somebody take their last breath. And it's all disheartening. I just have to remember that there were seven babies that I helped bring into this world. Um, I can tell you that 
Um, outside of that part being rewarding, one of the other aspects that's most rewarding for my job, um, as a training coordinator, prior to being training coordinator, I was a training officer. 13 years that I've been here, I've spent 10 of them training. I literally got certified and within a couple months of being certified, I started training. My most rewarding part of my job is teaching new people how to do my job so that when I'm no longer here, I know that they are taking care of the officers, the citizens, and the firefighter medics as I would. It definitely means a lot knowing that I get to help form the future of our 911 center. Um, when we talk about other things that are rewarding, I have a coworker that was able to assist park rangers in locating two lost juveniles inside of the Newport News Park by utilizing a system we have that pings the 911 cell phone. And she was able to direct the park rangers right in, which is amazing. I've had a couple um, coworkers just this past four months ago, I believe it was, excuse me, they um, took a couple overdoses and were able to assist with providing life-saving CPR for the citizens. All of that's amazing because you always hear the negative that goes on in the city and you never hear all this awesome stuff that the police department's doing and the dispatch center is doing to make the city a better place. Um, now, moving on, we want to talk about the national movement to reclassify um, for reclassify us as first responders or public safety occupation. And the importance to that is right now, as a 911 dispatcher, 911 telecommunicator, public safety specialist, um, wherever you are, what city you're in, um, there's a movement called the 911 Saves Act. 911 Saves Act currently is going forward towards Congress to put us in the same classification as officers and firefighters and medics. In case you didn't know, 911 dispatchers fall under the rank of administrative assistant. Um, no hard feelings towards anybody that's administrative assistant. However, I always like to say, um, if you're an administrative assistant, the likelihood of you taking a life or death call and having to make a split decision, um, a split second decision that could ultimately alter somebody's life is very low, very low. When you call 911 every day, the choices I make, the questions I ask, whether or not I'm doing my job properly affects the population, it affects the community, it affects officers, and it affects firefighter medics. If I'm not doing my job properly, if I'm not training people correctly, if we're not staying ahead of the curve, then we end up setting ourselves up for failure and ultimately somebody could die in the process because we didn't do something right. As an administrative assistant, that's not an issue. You guys don't have that that you have to worry about when you come into work. Um, so I cannot stress enough the importance to get behind that. Um, I have provided the link a couple times in some of the chiefs um, chat with the chief that you guys do on Facebook. And I have um, provided the link to Jamie to post on the website should it be asked for. I also have, um, it will also be posted on our Newport News Police Communications website so that you guys are able to send an email. It gives you a format. The link takes you to a format where you, it automatically is pre-filled out. You can send it to um, Bobby Scott. You can send it to the senator that's going into the house so that you could show them that you support us. Well, we're working towards that federally. We are also working here at home to put together, and by home I mean here in Newport News, our 911 center is currently working to get us classified as first responders and be the first city in the state of Virginia that sees that. Or the first city in the state of Virginia that sees that. I apologize, I thought I said it wrong. So. Our goal is to go before um, City Council with the Chief's permission to um, look forward to this becoming um, a new title or a new, new um, movement to reclassify us. It's extremely important. One of the things that benefits us is it will allow us to retire 25 years instead of 30. It will also assist us in showing that we are the first of the first responders. In all honesty, when people think about us, 
um, they only think about us on their worst day when they have to call us. Everybody thinks about the officers because you see them in their cars with their blue lights. Everybody thinks about the firefighters and the medics because you see them out there on their trucks. Nobody thinks about us behind the scenes. However, if it were not for us, you guys wouldn't see our officers with their blue lights or the fire trucks or the medics. We are the first link um, that gets you who you need when you need them. And then the last thing that um, I wanted to talk about was the family atmosphere that we have down in the 911 center. So down in our center, we currently have 60 personnel, 60 of us. That's, that's a lot of people. I have been there when our center was down in the 20s. So to see us with 60 personnel is amazing. Um, it, it fills me with joy to see that many people that have come in the center. Um, we celebrate birthdays. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate various holidays. Sometimes we have big potlucks, just have potlucks. Um, in case you didn't know, the second week in April is National Telecommunicator Week. Literally every 911 center in the area um, throughout the United States will be celebrating themselves. Generally, this is a time that we celebrate ourselves, gives our, give ourselves a pat on the back. You'll notice on our page, we'll start posting theme days. Um, things like that it's a great way we do secret dispatcher similar to that a secret santa and um we get gifts for each other and we do all kinds of different things to raise money so sometimes you know we sell shirts among ourselves um stuff that'll have our emblem on it and then that allows us then to purchase other things for ourselves so we've purchased coats for ourselves and things like that to give us a big yay us and boost morale um and then we have um, when we talk about the family atmosphere, we have dispatch babies, you know, as we slow as our families progress and get larger, we start to um, take them in and look at them as you have all these aunties and uncles that are working with your mom and then that's now your family. Outside of the 911 center itself, we also look at police and fire as being part of our family as well because we all do work so closely together even though we don't necessarily see each other's face. We work with each other between 8 to 10, 12 hours a day depending on what's going on and we deal with each other sometimes the whole shift all four days with three days off um, with no lacks. So you end up becoming one big, huge family. Um, hi, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I'm just learning how to do this whole Facebook. <laughs> and I see Val. Val's one of our supervisors on day shift. Hey, Rachel. Thank you, Sharon. Are there any questions? Does any because I talk, I talk really fast. Although I did pretty good today, because generally I'm like I zoom through stuff. Um, yes, Sharon, exactly. Yes, family matters. Together, all thrives. I don't know. I don't have anything else to talk about. Let's see. Mm. Oh, text to nine one one. So, for those that don't know, um, our 911 center back in June started to do text to 911 and transition over. This allows us previously, um, the only thing we had for those that might be hearing impaired was TTY or TDD. Um, however, now we also have an additional form for those that are hearing impaired or speech impaired to contact us as well as a citizen that is unable to contact us due to unforeseen circumstances. So think about um, a domestic violence case where um, you might have a, a female or male unable to call because their um, assailant is in the room. They're able to text us and let us know and the assailant has no idea. Or think about a robbery or a burglary in progress. They're able to text us and tell us. We of course encourage you to call 911 because it's much easier to talk to you over the phone. However, we understand that sometimes you just can't. Hence why we've now brought in text to 911 and it allows us to um, talk to you guys a little bit easier when times get rough. Thanks AK. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff.
Well, thank you for that, Pam. I really appreciate that. Definitely. Um, I know Jamie put it up there earlier, but we would definitely like your support when we start to move forward with the process. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions about our hiring process, about our academy? Um, I know some of you guys joined a little bit later, so you didn't get the opportunity to kind of hear me. I know you can watch it later on and watch back over it. Um, is there anything specific that you're curious about when it comes to our 911 center and what, we're, what we do or um, how we train our personnel prior to them hitting the floor? Thank you, Miriam. You're going easy on you. I know. That's a, this is what I asked for, so <laughs> they must have heard my prayers. <laughs> you're still alive oh look but i'm watching your screen <laughs> um so if you guys have any questions that you think of after watching this because of course it's going to be ending shortly um if you have any questions any concerns you can contact um the newport news police communications well it's newport news emergency communications for our facebook page you can contact the police department's page and they'll forward it to us um and if you have any information about it, um, they're getting ready to post the link right now so that you guys can look at our job um, description and get information about our hiring process. Like I said, we are hiring. We're looking to fill an April Academy. Um, I'm looking forward to doing my fifth Academy in a year. So we're getting us and keeping us fully staffed, which is what's most important. It allows us to give our personnel the breaks that they need. Um, it also allows us to go back to four days on with three days off, which is amazing. Um, I was telling Jamie earlier, I remember, you know, used to back in the day when you had to, and this was back in 2010, maybe I was working 17 hour shifts, going home and sleeping for, you know, six hours. Cause, um, I do not reside in the city, so it would take me a little time to get home, a little time to get back. And for those that don't know, when I tell you I'm an early bird, my shift is supposed to start at 8, and I'm always at work by 5 a.m. So, <laughs> I, I sleep very little because I'm always afraid I'm going to be late for something. Um, uh, Pam, the earliest you can apply is 18, and we have no set age limit. Um, for how old you can be. We will hire you straight out of high school with a GED or a high school diploma. You need no previous experience. You don't have to have any previous training. We are a fully accredited system, so we are able to teach you everything in academy and you get paid to be here. Um, depending, we can we start out, um, the range starts around 34, 586 and it goes up based off of um, any experience you might bring to the table, any training you might bring to the table, um, previous history in a 911 center. So we're definitely, um, I know I've got, we hired within the last year, we've hired three that were 19, um, which makes me feel really old because my oldest will be 19 this year. Um, <laughs> so it feels really strange teaching kids that could be my kids. Um, but, um, there is no age limit. All that, all the requirement that we have is that when we send you the critical test, which by the way, now we can do online. I forgot to add that. So you guys get a link and you're able to take it from home in the comfort of your pajamas, um, sitting on your couch, which is a lot nicer than coming in and having to worry about social distancing to make sure that there's enough space between you and the other tester, making sure that everything is wiped down. Um, and it allows me to test more people at once than it used to when I was bringing them in in person. Something that we started to do in March of last year, end of March, beginning of April, and it's really assisted us in being able to get more applicants in the door because we're able to contact more and test more than we did before. Um, but yeah, there's 
just 18 is the earliest and then the oldest is fair game. Mm. Okay, well, we've done, um, it's 1230, so. All right, well, um, we have done our half hour. If there's no other questions, um, we're going to go ahead and end Facebook Live. You guys are more than welcome to join us on the Newport News Emergency Communications page. Keep up to date with the Newport News Police Department's Facebook page. You could see this again if for some reason you can't share it here. You can also watch it on the YouTube channel. It's, it's posted up there along with the other um, community policing. And it was very nice to meet all you guys. Thank you for joining us.